Good evening. Welcome to our webinar hosted by the San Mateo County Dental Society. It looks like we have a big audience joining us today. My name is Ben Yon and I'm your SMCDS president. Before we get started, I want to review how we will be running this meeting. All participants will be placed on mute. Our presenters will provide a presentation on PPE and the PPP loan. During the presentation, you may post a question into the question and answer box. For those participants on your desktop, the question and answer box is located on the bottom of your screen. For those on an iPad or iPhone, the question and answer box should be on the upper right. Please feel free to post your questions, and if time permits, we will go over them at the end. So now let's get started. We're pleased to have two very experienced presenters with us tonight. Our first presenter is Dr. Bruce Bohannon. Dr. Bohannon has been practicing oral and maxiofacial surgery since 1998. He is an honor graduate of UOP Dental School and graduated with distinction from University of Missouri where he received his medical degree and completed his residency. He became board certified in oral maxiofacial surgery in 2000. He maintains private practices in Burlingame and San Jose. So please welcome Dr. Bohannon. Thanks guys for having me. So is my screen share enabled? Guys? Yes. Okay. Give me one second. Okay, let me just start the webinar here. So thanks very much for inviting me tonight. So we're trying to get you some information on what's going on in the community and trying to defend yourself, your staff, and your patients. So what to expect? Well, what we know from this is that there's really no consensus out there. So it's very difficult to find information about what needs to be done and how to do things. And there's different agencies and regulations and societies that are all giving each other information. And there's very lack of putting all that together and putting it out in a consumable fashion. So a lot of research has to be done. And luckily the CDA and the ADA have done a very good job of putting all of that together because there's a lot of moving parts here. So it's very fluid. What, what we say today may be different tomorrow and what recommendations will become regulation is unknown at this time. So I like to call it a symphony of confusion. And you've got a lot of people trying to capitalize on the pandemic and the fear that's associated with the pandemic. They try to sell you things that they think will become standards. So the key is you have to educate yourself. So you have to overcome your fear and how you do that is with knowledge. Through knowledge comes calm and it unveils the steps necessary to mitigate risk and ensure success. Okay, knowledge and understand, uh, understanding vanquishes fear. Uh, if you decide you want to crawl in a hole and wait for this to blow over, you're probably going to be into 2024. If you want to take the bull by the horns and take control of the situation, it's, it's uh, a daunting task, but if you break it down step by step, it's very easy. So you need to study, choose, and implement. Decide what, you would, uh, decide what will work for you in your situation and develop a dynamic plan or blueprint and execute your plan. And then adapt it as you learn more because nothing will be static. This will be a very dynamic situation. So how contagious is that? And how we define contagion is what's called the r naught. So in epidemiology, it's the basic re reproductive number of an infection. So if you had somebody that's infected in a room with 100 people that could be infected if they received the proper inoculate dose, how many people would that single person infect? And we know it's all over the place. I have found it from as little as two to somewhere almost to nine. WHO and the CDC thinks it's somewhere between two and a half and three. But if we just look at four, if it's the R naught is four, and four give it to 16, or one gives it to four, and then four gives it to 16, that's 21, you gotta add that through. 
If you look at 10 generations, that's almost 1.4 million people would be infected, okay? If the R0 was eight after 10 generations, it's 1.23 billion. So this is something to, to consider. If we compare it to influenza, influenza has an R0 of about 1.4 to 1.6, but then you look at measles. Measles is 12 to 18, which uh, just blows my mind that somebody wouldn't want to get a vaccine for measles. So what's going out on in the community? So if we look at San Mateo County, we really didn't have a surge. I think the people were very good at doing their mitigation strategies. Currently, when I wrote, started this lecture a few days ago, putting it together, there's only two in-house patients at Peninsula Hospital. Ventilators, we really didn't run out of ventilators here. And basically we had, when that first started a 20-20-20 rule, meaning 20% 20 patients never came, 20 of patients never came off ventilators. So if you went on one, it was very likely you weren't getting off. So now the, now the feeling is we don't put you on that until it's absolutely necessary. 20% they thought were asymptomatic carriers and 20% of the people that came into the hospital required admission. And now we have combined therapies where we're seeing, at least in this area, about 15 to 20% uh, are, are, are dying from a ventilator. So that's a vast improvement and the time on the ventilator is decreasing. Uh, we have treatments available. Rendizivir is a very, very promising treatment uh, to shorten uh, hospital stays as well as the severity in the ICU. We have immune modulators because one of the problems that we see in this, this situation is your own immune system, the cytokine storm they talk about that does more damage than good sometimes. Convalescent plasma is using antibodies from people that have recovered from the disease. And combination therapies are working pretty well. If you look at the drug Coletra, which is very common in HIV, combining it with uh, ribavirin and interferon seems to be re working really well, where Coletra by itself had very little effect. Uh, and if we look at some experimental treatments by Cedar sinai they have an experimental drug called CAP1002. It's a heart inflammation drug that drastically reduces the inflammation in the lung and the patient's body and they're coming off ventilators quite quickly and uh, they're expanding that study and that one looks pretty good. So the roles of the dentist are hospital aversions. We wanna keep people out of the hospital. We expected a surge, so we didn't wanna see a, a huge number of patients flooding into the hospital to overwhelm them. Plus, uh, if you go to the hospital, that's where you're likely to encounter people with the disease. So unfortunately, dental emergencies presenting to the emergency rooms are up about three to five fold, okay? Um, so a lot of doctors are shut down, uh, screening is limited, and you have patients that are scared. They simply don't wanna come to your office and they certainly don't wanna go to the emergency room unless it's necessary. So the delayed treatment has left, you know, has created some other serious medical conditions. Opioid use is on the rise. Complications associated with antibiotics are on the rise. Psychiatric disorders are spiking through the roof, including suicide. Violent crimes were initially down, but now they're starting to grow. We're also seeing motor vehicle accidents where there's not as many, but the lethal ones are up because people are speeding because the roads are clear. And then we're seeing healthcare being crippled. Um, all this treatment they're covering and they're not getting federal funding to, to create the, the budget to pay for all this stuff. Secondly, a lot of the elective stuff that makes hospitals money are being put off. So we also see, unfortunately, child molestation is, is on the rise. Elective surgeries, like I mentioned, are put off. So cancer surgeries are being delayed in some cases. And it's slowly returning, but you have to go through uh, quite a lot of um, red tape to actually get your patient there. Medical follow-up and drug maintenance is, is way off. So we're seeing diabetics coming to the emergency room with what's called di uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, meaning their diabetes is out of control. And the public has to regain confidence in order to return to the healthcare uh, environment, whether it's dental or medical. And the media is definitely biased to fear. That's what sells. So it's gonna be a long re-education process that begins with personal contact from you. Media campaigns, whether it's email, social media, phone calls, things like that help the patient understand all that you're doing to protect them. 
as well as yourself. And then hopefully our society will start putting out commercials to start to ease the fear of the patients that are out there. So vaccines, really, we're not gonna get back to normal until we have a vaccine or this thing runs through the community. You have 150, uh, well, that says counties. It should be countries that are working on the vaccine. Emergency use authorization uh, is fast tracking uh, these vaccines. Um, vaccines typically take five to eight years, but hopefully through this accelerated method, we'll see it in eight to 18 months. And how they do that is when they're in phase two, they actually start producing the vaccine because that's the rate limiting step is the production of that vaccine. So it can be disseminated to millions of people. So companies will produce it before it's actually approved. Currently, there's about 100 vaccines in development around the world. There's eight human trials in the US and today Moderna put out great news in their phase one and early phase two. They showed in all the patients no side effects and they had antibodies higher than patients that were typically infected and recovered from COVID. Now, they don't know if these antibodies will protect them from COVID and I don't know how they work exposing the patient to COVID, but it's actually quite promising. Uh, this is an RNA virus, so it may be very, very difficult for a vaccine to work perfectly. It may be similar, more similar to the flu, where it works on a certain percentage of patients and it's seasonal. As the, as the, as the RNA viruses tend to mutate, you may have to adjust the vaccine a, as it goes on. So we are flattening the curve here uh, in California. It is, it is going down, but, and we are beginning phase two, but who knows what's gonna happen when we start to open up. But the good news is that we've learned from the disease and our, our healthcare situation is better prepared if we have a second surge. So what's gonna get us back to normal? Well, we talked about herd immunity and we talked about vaccines, but in order to come up with the disinfectant that's gonna work for society, you have science that's putting their input forth. You've got politics, which is all over the place and every governor and, and mayor seem to have a different feeling on what to do. You have also the pressures of different regulations, I mean, or regulatory bodies like OSHA and the Department of Public Health and NIH and the CDC making recommendations that then the, the legislators and the regulators have to digest. You have economic pressures and of course you have social pressures. People are getting frustrated. They got to get back to work. So herd immunity, what, what is that? Okay, so herd immunity means the virus, if, if it's out there and somebody's infected, it's got really nowhere to go. And to get that, depending on what study you'll read, you'll see anywhere between six and 90 percent. Most of the studies are going to be uh, show you about 79 to 90 percent of the population has to become infected. Well in our state right now the death rate is around four percent. So if 50 percent of the people became infected that it would equate to almost 800,000 deaths. Really the death rate is somewhere around one percent when you start to expand testing because right now we're only testing the sick. Uh, we're not really testing a lot of asymptomatic patients. Uh, and we're not testing the healthy patients yet. And so that number is still probably around 1% or less than 1%, but that's still almost 200,000 deaths. And so if we look at comparison on 3-1 of 20 in the United States, there was one COVID death. By 4-11, it was the leading cause of death in the country. However, when we look at it in California, when you compare it to other things that's mentioned up there, you'll see it's actually quite low, but that doesn't mean you should minimize how dangerous this virus is. So what can we do then to mitigate the risk of this virus? Well, distancing policies are gonna be very important. That's your administrative changes within your office. And I don't have a lot of time to go into that today because this is mostly PPE. There'll be a separate recorded lecture uh, on what you can do for your administrative policies, but the ADA has put out a wonderful thing, a get back to work toolkit that breaks all of this down and you can pick and choose uh, different things from that toolkit and create your own policy. It's a very powerful thing. You guys should definitely go to the ADA's website and get that. Then there's certain environmental controls that you can make. You can remove fomites, your magazines, your games, your beverages. You got to cover your keyboard and your mouse. Those are potential things to uh, spread the disease. 
pens, a uh, simple thing, have a cup with clean pens. When they're, when they're done using it, they move it into the dirty pen area. Uh, clean all the contacts as soon as the patients come by. So you're gonna have to repetitively clean everything that's around. Use a high quality disinfectant. So the disinfectants that you typically use now work very well against this virus. This virus is actually quite fragile. Um, you could consider fogging and we'll go into that later. UV sterilization, that's another thing. However, basic sterilization works just fine. Those would be an, uh, an adjunct to those. One of the biggest things of my pet peeve is the phone. So your, 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 your assistants, your workers are gonna come in, they're gonna use their phone. The first thing they should do is take their phone out of their case and put it in a, a sealable uh, baggie. Then they can use their phone all they want after they do their hand washing, take the phone out and then they leave, okay? Because the phone, they're sitting there all day playing on the phone and that's when that, that's when the, that phone is a very big fomite that can transmit the, uh, the infection. So that's, that's a big pet peeve of mine. Engineering, air scrubbing, UV sterilization within your, your, which in your HVAC system where a standalone one works, help, HEPA filtration. And we'll go over this later, but what is your current HVAC situation in your office? There are different standards depending on when your office was built. Prior to 2001, it was at least six air exchange per minute. After 2012, it's, it's, it's greater than 12. You wanna make sure that you at least have a MERV 13 rating or HEPA filtration in there if you can't. If not, you may have to have some standalone units that are scrubbing your air for you. And then PPE, this is your biggest weapon against the virus. It's gloves, masks, goggles, face shields, head covering, shoe covering, gowns, laundry, donning and doffing procedures, and of course, hand hygiene. I'm wearing a hat because none of us have had a haircut. My hair looks terrible, but the good news is um, I can wear a cap as soon as I get to the office so I can cover up my nasty looking hair. <clears throat> So how can we protect ourselves? Well, we talked about skin protection, protection, and that's the gowns, the head covers. You're basically trying to cover as much exposed skin as you can. Reducing aerosols. Well, sometimes in our job, that's gonna be difficult. So isolation is really important. So rubber dams, of course, block the oral pharynx. So if you're working on a single tooth or in an arch, that's a great way to mitigate the amount of aerosol that's produced. Air scrubbing, maybe planting a nasal hood over the patient as well, so their, their nasopharynx is restricted, at least in the dissemination of aerosols from their normal breathing. And then you wanna have a staggered turnover. So you wanna make sure that not a lot of people are crossing each other. So treat one patient, have them come in one way and exit another if that's a possibility in your office. You also have to watch staff. You wanna to try to make sure you can mitigate their contact as much as possible. So the break rooms where everybody had lunch together, unfortunately, that's not gonna happen here. And you need to protect your nose and mouth and your eyes. That's where this thing gets in. So if those are protected, you really have taken away the teeth of the virus. So how can we protect ourselves? I kind of went over this already, but you have to choose what's appropriate for your practice. Um, oral surgery is gonna be different than ortho. An endodontist practice is going to be different than a perio practice. So, and then the way your office is designed is going to be a big deal. So if you have an open bay versus partitioned room, the partitioned room is going to be better than an open bay because aerosols can spread. So you may have to take some engineering or environmental changes of your office, the way it's set up. You may have to remove some chairs. You may have to put in partitions. So take countermeasures, learn what's required and what isn't, and implement what you think you need. And remember, perception is going to be big to your staff and as well as your patients. So you want to reduce their anxiety and fear. So you're, you have to promote what you're doing to protect them. Okay. Also, the biggest rate limiting step of opening is probably going to be your PPE. So the recommendation is you have at least two weeks of supply of your PPE prior to opening. Right, how can we protect ourselves? Well, we so far, we know this spreads through contact and aerosol and it can remain in the air three hours and it can spread from six to 13 feet. You've even seen a study where somebody had some sort of Olympic level 
sneeze and could get it 27 feet out. You have to remember those studies are done in a very closed environment with no airflow at all. So they're really not um, a good representation of what happens in our office. This can remain active on hard surfaces for two to three days. The virus is small, but viral particles by themselves are not going to infect you. It really needs to be a droplet-borne transmission. <clears throat> and if we look this, uh, below, I put a finding there. Uh, the six-foot rule is probably not uh, super accurate. It's probably closer to 13. Okay, so our, our first defense is masks, okay? There are different types of masks set forth by the American Society for Testing and Materials. The lowest performing mask is the cone mask you see above. It's got a single strap and it fits very loosely and its filtering capability is pretty low, but it does provide some barrier to fluid. Level one masks, and as you go up, they become a little bit, uh, they become more improved in their filtration ability, but the more importantly, they become more fluid resistant. So our friends in these masks are gonna be probably your level one mask for your people that are fairly distanced from, it may be your front office staff, they're fairly distanced from patients, but your, your people that are closer, you're gonna have a minimum of level three masks that's gonna be required. So what are the different types of masks? What's the anatomy of a mask? Why do these masks work better than you know, a cloth covering? What, what does the ADA say for your risk management? What's a contingency mode if you can't get an N95 or an equivalent? What is a fit test and a seal check that you hear about? What are the legitimate masks that are available out there? Because there are a ton of counterfeit masks that are available. Dental Economics actually put out a study that said, or a paper, sorry, that said 65 of the 80 imported masks have been deemed non-NIOSH approved by our government. So you have to consistently check the government site which manufacturers, suppliers are legitimate and which ones are not. And so that obviously makes it uh, difficult for availability because right now all the N95 masks are being diverted to medical. Secondly, if you look at Honeywell and 3M, they're the ones that make the masks. They have massive, massive contracts that they have to fill with the government. So it's going to be a while before those flood back into the market for us, probably sometime in the early or maybe middle of, of the fall. Second, the other big thing is raw materials. So you you heard about the nasal swabs and the raw materials for that. Well, we'll learn through this lecture that there's a particular layer in this mask that has that, it's that same stuff that makes the swab. And most of that comes from Northern Italy. And of course, Northern Italy is in, uh, well, they're coming out of it, but they had a horrible time with this COVID issue. So we see the level of mass. And the one thing I want to point out here is that as the levels go up, filtration is better, but fluid resistance is key. So if we learn a little bit about an N95, the reason they work better than a level three mask is their inner, inner filter or uh, layer that they have is more dense and more cross length than that of a surgical mask. So it has better filtration, but the key is the fit. The fit of an N95, if it's fit right, fits way better, it's way more superior than a, than a level three. And however, it's very susceptible to fluids. So it be, if it becomes soiled, the mask is useless. And we now know through emergency use authorizations, these masks can be recycled, but you need to protect them. So the way you protect them is you try to use a level three mask over the N95 to prevent them from becoming soiled. So the layers of the mask, this is important. And the, the key is that the non-woven layers on the inside and out have the fluid resistance but what gives a filtration ability is the melt blown cloth layer. And this is the one that's in level three as well as N95, but the way it's cross linked that you can see in that scanning electron microscope is more dense in the N95 and that's why it filters better. But again, the biggest difference between the N95 and the level three is fit, okay? That's the biggest difference. There are studies that show influenza and if you look at influenza a and b it's roughly the same size as the coronavirus 
they did a study, of course, it's in a lab, it's not in this dental setting, so you have to extrapolate, and that may not be the best, but they found no statistical difference between a level three and an N95, as long as the N, or as long as the level three was well fit. So that's the key, is it has to fit well. But if you want the, if you want the best tool to fight this, N95 is the way to go. So there's different kinds of masks, different respirator types. There's disposable masks that we're used to. There's the half face masks that painters and uh, different uh, types of uh, environmental uh, workers use. And then of course there's the full face mask that uh, firemen and, and people like that use. And the definition of an N95 mask, basically it's intended to cover the nose and the mouth and help reduce the wear to exposure to pathogenic biological airborne particulates fancy term called FFR. This is the actual regulation that runs it if you want to look it up, but N means it's not oil resistant. Okay, there are other types of mask, R, which is somewhat resistant to oil and P, strongly resistant, but it's the N95 mask that we use in, in medicine and that lack of oil resistance is why we like to use a mask over it to protect it. So who regulates all this stuff? Well, if we look, the FDA regulates the entities or the manufacturers, the National Institute for Occupational Safety or, or, or uh, the NIOSH, that's what everybody hears. They actually regulate the actual product and deem it to be good or not. And then you have OSHA, which regulates the user and how the device is used. <clears throat> and the ADA has put out risk management and the lowest risk is N95. Okay, so that's, and you'll see that in all of the ADA's literature that's on their site. An acceptable alternative in this emergency use authorization is the use of a face shield over a level three mask. Now it's not, it's not perfectly equivalent, but it's really darn close. So if you don't have the ability to get an N95 or an equivalent, then this would typically be an acceptable alternative. So the emergency use authorization came out with a crisis capacity strategy, and this is what has allowed us to use things that are not N95 masks. Uh, we now can use foreign masks. KN95 is the big one, and that, of course, comes from China. Okay, so if we look at the equivalents, they're, they're very close. And the standards that are used in China or in the EU, with the EU as the FFP2 or FFP3, uh, or the Korean special, but I don't think any of those are actually over here. So the ones you're going to see are the KN95. Their standards are similar to ours, but they have to be NIOSH approved to have use over here. So again, the FFP that you see here, this is your EU version. The N95 is what we have here in the States and the KN95 is what we're seeing coming from China. And then we also see these masks that are out, these masks with a little carburetor ventilator here. These are fine for people that are using industrial use, but it's not a medical use, because when you breathe, this doesn't filter what you breathe, so the patient's at risk. Therefore, if you have these, unfortunately, you can't use them, and it's not recommended that you put a mask over this. So unfortunately, if you have them, you really shouldn't be using them in your office. So fit testing. Now, prior to, prior to this emergency use authorization, you had to have these masks fit tested. And there's two types. There's qualitative and quantitative. Qualitative means after a uh, user is well fitted, a bag is placed over their head and they're given something to smell. And if they can detect the smell, then the mask isn't fitted right and has to be readjusted. A quantitative test is actually a machine that sends pressure into the mask and then it's evaluated uh, from an actual measurement rather than a subjective uh, recall from the patient. But the regulation is waived for both the initial and the fit testing. However, you still should do a medical review with your staff. And the reason being is that the N95 mask can have some issues with pat uh, patients with pulmonary disease or claustrophobia. We also know that some studies have showed that breathing in and out against the resistance of the N95 mask can have some damage to the pulmonary tree. And so long use of the N95 is not recommended. So you should have um, 
plenty of times during the day where you can take a break from the N95. So there's short, there's a, unfortunately, you can do this yourself. There's no, there's no regulatory body that uh, certifies somebody as a fit tester. However, the shortage of these testing hoods and then the little Bittrex um, bitter th uh, uh, things that they put in there for you to smell, you can't get them anymore. However, it's probably better if you use a service. And the reason for that is if anybody came back and you did the fit testing and maybe somebody could say that the fit testing was not accurate, it, it creates some liability possibly on your end. So it may be better to have a service do it. <clears throat> and this shows both how it's done from the qualitative, the bag and the little bitrous uh, saccharin fluid that they pump in here that creates a vapor. And then here is the actual pressure test. And so there are some testing services. There's Concentra and on-site fitting uh, and fast response. Concentra is probably the most well uh, distributed one in the Bay Area. Um, so if you're gonna use the test for your patients, or not for your patients, for your staff, this would be the one to use. Um, the issue is you don't have to do it. You just have to make a good faith uh, effort to follow the guidelines that are listed here. Uh, and that all will come uh, in a PDF to you, all the links that are shown here today. So that'll come out in a day or two to you so you can follow it yourself. But the issue, the issue is um, San Mateo, is also, the Dental Society is also doing it for you guys. But with the fit testing, you have to have a medical exam first and then the test is performed. The issue that we're seeing is that these companies are filling up. And even though you can do this yourself, the problem, and you don't need to do it, I'm sorry, I'm getting off on a tangent, but uh, the, the, the regulation has been waived. However, I still think it's a good idea because you don't know, you've never worked with an N95 before, you don't know if this really fits well for your staff. So if you really wanna go the extra mile, even though it's not a regulation at this moment, uh, however, when it's list, uh, lifted, it will be, it's a good idea for you to protect your patients. I think your patients would improve it. Regardless of the fit check, every time you use the mask, you have to do a user seal check. You have to inspect the mask for damage or soilage. If the straps are weak and the elasticity is failing, you have to, th you have to throw it away. Um, you have to mold and conform it to your face with a cup hand. It's not a substitute again for the fit test. Um, and then you do a positive pressure seal test. So as you're holding it against your face, you blow out. The mask should bulge. If it doesn't bulge, there's a leak. And the negative pressure test, similar, hold it. When you breathe in, you should see the face piece start to collapse. Now, the, the key is with these tests, is they have to be performed each day, and they have to be performed with the same mask. If you get fit tested with an N95, and then you change the model number, or you go into a KN95, that fit test is invalid. It has to be for the type of mask that you use. The KN95 you're gonna see is typically just a single ear loop. It doesn't have the, the vertex strap and the neck strap like the 3M and Honey, Honeywell um, uh, N95 mask. So they don't fit as well. So getting a positive or getting a, a passing fit test is harder with the KN95s. And this is just going over the seal check. Uh-oh, my computer's frozen. Well, guys, I don't know if you can hear me, but I have a computer issue. Still hear you. Okay, uh, I, I don't know what's going on here. So we may want to go to the other um, presenter and then I'll present what I have left. It's not that much more, but it's still probably another 10 minutes and while I try to fix what's going on here. All right, uh, Hayden and uh, Brett, are you guys cool with that? We are. All yeah. right. So our next presenters are Hayden Warren and Brett Lamont, CPAs from Thomas Dahl. Thomas Dahl in Walnut Creek, California is a CPA pension plan administration 
and wealth management firm from with over 400 dentist clients. The firm is a member of the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants and is a founding member of the Academy of Dental CPAs, a group of 30 CPA firms across the country who collectively, collectively represent over 9,000 dentists. So thank you, uh, Brett and Hayden for being here and take it away. All right, it looks like we may have a problem with uh, screen sharing while the other computer is locked up. It's not letting me uh, share my screen. So maybe Bruce can um, disconnect from the meeting and reconnect. And I'll just go ahead and start because um, I have my slides on another screen and um, we'll do our best to get those back up when um, we can. But forgive me for looking away, I'll use my other screen to just get started. All right, so um, my good friend Brett and I are gonna be talking about PPP loan forgiveness. And um, it's a complicated subject as everybody knows. And um, there are some things that we know and some things that we don't know. So I'll start out with some of the things that we do know. Um, the SBA and Treasury released their uh, Paycheck Protection Program Loan Forgiveness application on Friday. And it's kind of a major document. Maybe Nakia has sent that around. I shared it with her today. Um, looks like maybe I can try sh sharing my screen again. No. Uh, a couple of things about the PPP program. According to the uh, Treasury, um, there will not be any changes made to the eight week forgiveness period. And that is not great news for most of us who would prefer we were able to move that period around some. Uh, but as it stands right now, that is, that is unchanged. Um, there is, however, a, a new option for the beginning of the eight week period as it relates only to payroll costs. And of course, I'll, I'll talk about payroll costs in a minute, but basically um, there's some flexibility there just depending on when you run your payroll typically. Um, there's also a little bit of flexibility with, um, here we go with the screen. There we go. And we're off. Excellent. Hopefully we can, everybody can see the screen. I didn't get too far along before uh, we were able to get that back. So um, we talked about the pay periods. There's, there's an option for that that I'll go into. Uh, there are detailed instructions with this application. And the application has several pages. Uh, Brett is gonna go through those uh, after we finish up with the PowerPoint slides. And he'll go sort of line by line and help us figure that thing out. Um, one of the other issues that has come up frequently is how the heck can I make sure that I have the same number of people or full-time equivalents on June 30th as I had on February 15th. There's a little bit of uh, flexibility with that for folks that have retired and, and um, who are not in a position to come back to work for uh, COVID-19 reasons. Um, and then one of the things that we're learning more and more about is that the way the uh, act is written, the CARES Act, is that um, self-employed folks may be subject to a little bit of discrimination. And we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. The other thing, thing we know uh, is that, you know, these days are over 
And uh, Bruce will talk more about that in a second when he gets his computer back up. And that this is kind of the new normal. Um, pretty, uh, pretty stressful set of circumstances for, for you dentists out there who already have a tough uh, profession to deal with, with being, um, you know, the employer, the production line, the marketing department, and so forth. And now you have to kind of be your own OSHA department. Some of the things that we're not super um, conscious of at the moment um, and are still trying to get some, some clarification on, and that is related to owner retirement plan contributions. And again, this issue of um, self-employed being treated a little bit differently than, than folks with corporations. Um, and as it relates to retirement plan contributions, this concept of paid or incurred is very, very important. So during the eight week period, um, eligible expenses will be either paid or incurred during that period of time. We'll talk about that in a second. As it relates to the contributions that you can count for covered payroll costs, um, we still don't know if we're looking at 2019 contributions uh, because you know we might be paying those even this year or 2020 contributions because they're incurred. Um, and are we able to lump the whole amount in the eight week period or just take eight fifty seconds of uh, the amount that's accruing during the current year. Um, pretty tricky stuff. And with health insurance, it looks like uh, corporations can count that as a covered payroll cost and self-employed folks for themselves uh, may not. So unless there's a group policy um, that the uh, self-employed dentist is included in, so there's a lot of uh, gray area here and we're hoping to get more clarification and better, better answers than are out there right now on some of these points. Things that you'll need to have available when you fill out the application and Brett will again be going through this in detail, um, but you'll need the original loan amount, the date it was dispersed, um, you know, the number of employees at the uh, time of application, meaning the February 15th required date, and then the uh, number of full-time equivalents um, on June 30th, the forgiveness date, and whether or not you had an EIDL grant uh, or advance, because that counts uh, towards your forgiveness um, with the PPP loan. And then of course, lots of payroll schedules that you'll need to accumulate. This is just a picture of the, um, top of the application and some of the items that, that I just mentioned on the screen before. Um, it's several pages long and as I said, Brett will be going through that. So I talked for a minute about the um, eight week covered period. It starts when you receive your funds. I had a client send, he copied me on an email to his bank, uh, the bank that made his PPP loan. And he said, you know, you've got this document that you sent me that says my loan was dispersed on, I think it was April 14th, but it wasn't until the 20th that the money hit my account. So we don't want to have questions like that um, when we're trying to figure out the forgiveness amount on a PPP loan. So check with your lender, make sure that the date you saw the money show up in your bank account is the date that they are gonna use for your disbursement date, because uh, that's vital. And then this other concept we mentioned a minute ago, costs paid or incurred. And I highlighted and bolded or, um, because it used to be that it was paid and incurred, which was really um, cumbersome and tricky. So if you, for example, with um, your rent or your payroll um, incurred the expense prior to the, the funding of your PPP loan or the beginning of your eight week period, uh, if it was incurred before and paid during, uh, that's okay. 
um, or if it was incurred during and paid after, uh, that's okay. Now, this is not a license to lump uh, six months of rent um, or mortgage payments or what have you into the eight week period. Um, it's meant to account for the fact that um, everybody's eight week period starts at a different time. And, you know, if you paid your rent on the 1st of May and here it is the 18th, um, you know, and your, your starting date was May 2nd, you're going to get your May rent in the eight week period. Um, and if it was incurred during the eight week period and you hadn't paid it yet, uh, same answer. You're, you're going to be okay with some flexibility on either side of that eight week period. There are very specific rules related to the payroll costs. And of course the payroll costs include wages, um, and some other things like retirement plan contributions and group health insurance. Um, but the wages are considered paid on the date that uh, the ACH transfer, if you're using a direct deposit with a payroll service, um, the date that that ACH was initiated uh, is the date that the payroll is considered paid. So if you're right on the cusp of your eight week period, um, you're going to want to make sure that your pay date, your, your payroll service pushes the button such that that final payroll gets in that eight week period. And if you are on an old fashioned uh, payroll service, like some folks, uh, you're going to use the check date. So whatever the date uh, on the check was issued, um, that'll be the, the date that the uh, payroll was considered paid. So if you got your PPP loan on May 15th and you have a payroll period from May 1st to the 15th, that pay period is an eligible payroll cost uh, that you'll include in your forgiveness application. Um, now this concept of incurred, incurred is uh, on a day that wages were earned. So a client emailed me this morning asking about this very specific issue. And um, if your uh, eight week forgiveness period ends on June 25th um, and your pay period ends on June 30th and your pay date is July 3rd, I'm throwing out a lot of dates here. Um, the payroll up to June 25th will be an eligible payroll cost. So it gets a little tricky. You want to make sure that you really pin down uh, these exact dates so that you can maximize your forgiveness. This is a little, little tricky as well. It's the alternative payroll covered period. And this is in the instructions and new uh, to us as of last Friday when these instructions came out. But um, basically it says that the borrower may elect to start their eight week covered period, again, for payroll only, uh, on the first date of the first pay period following the date the PPP loan was funded. All right, so if your PPP loan was funded on May 20th uh, and you pay your payroll every uh, twice a month, every other, every other uh, semi-monthly, then the first day of the next or the first pay period after your PPP funding date is June 1st. So your alternative pay period um, for, for PPP loan forgiveness would be the uh, pay period that starts on June 1st. So basically what's gonna happen is if you select this alternative schedule, the purpose of it would be to account for every single day during the eight week period um, following your forgiveness. The reason this is important is that everybody has a different start date for the eight week period. And not everybody has brought their staff back to work yet. Uh, some people have been having, you know, uh, one or two people in the office rotating and just sort of taking care of things. Um, we have a skeleton crew at our office, um, but you know, that's a dozen people and the other 60 of us are working from home now, but 
you have employees that have been home on unemployment and um, you know, you may or may not have brought them back to work yet. So it could be that your eight weeks started earlier than you would have liked. And this will give you the opportunity to just kick the payroll can down the road a few days um, if it's helpful. Um, so in addition, and I'm gonna back up a bullet point or two here, this is not just for payroll, meaning paychecks, this is uh, all payroll costs. So if you pick the alternative payroll covered period, you're doing so for payroll, for wages, but also for the health insurance and for the retirement plan contributions that are eligible. So that's tricky stuff. Brett put this nice uh, chart together. I had some um, funky pictures of calendars with dates highlighted and so forth, but this is just sort of an illustration for, for to be helpful in terms of figuring out your eight week covered period and when the alternative payroll period uh, might start. You, what this means is that, you know, you'll have potentially two eight week running periods because the payroll eight week period can be different from the uh, rent and utilities eight week covered period. So you're gonna wanna really sit down with a calendar and, and um, plug in the dates and mark them off each day on the calendar like, like the old days. Oh, Brett, you've got this thing animated. That's, that's awesome. So um, yeah, he's showing in here that uh, there could be dates when uh, folks are on unemployment um, and you know when different things can start. That's, that's cool. All right, so as far as eligible expenses are concerned, um, we have a worksheet. Uh, some of you have seen this already. Um, this is just a screenshot of the top of it, but uh, on our website, this is open to any, anyone who wants to go check it out, but um, we have a worksheet that sort of compares the uh, forgivable expenses uh, to, in the PPP loan and the eligible expenses uh, in the PPP loan compared to the uh, EIDL grant or, or loan. So you want to make sure you understand if you've gotten both those loans that um, you have to be careful about what you pay with each of them. Hey, hey I, I wanted to jump in real quick uh, before Please you do. go on. So, uh, you might, I, I just want to give a heads up. We have this posted on our website and there, there's probably 20 different categories of expenses. Uh, we, we have been taking a very high volume of questions on uh, j just different expenses. You know, people are asking, hey, can I do this or that or this? And, and it's, it's really all listed in this eligibility guide. Uh, you can just go to our, our website and plug in your information and, and uh, get access to that. Very good. Okay, so this is sort of a recap um, of eligible payroll costs. And I'm gonna go quickly through this because the um, material that Brett has is, is quite a bit more important. And this is somewhat old news, but basically wages up to 100,000, that includes for sole proprietors. If your 2019 Schedule C was 80,000, that's your, that's your starting point. If it was 200, your ceiling is 100,000. Healthcare expenses for group health insurance, and then your retirement plan contributions, um, which are for you know, those that the employer makes. You as the practice owner pay into the uh, profit sharing plan with you know, a matching and profit sharing. Uh, some of you might have a defined benefit plan and pay into that for your employees as well. Um, but whatever you pay the employee, and whatever they do with their money, meaning how much they put into the 401k plan, is irrelevant as it relates to your forgiveness, just their gross wages. And then 
you have what I call little doodad taxes. And those are the um, um, employer taxes for California unemployment insurance and, and um, the employee training tax. Those are nominal amounts, but uh, we don't want to miss those because every dollar counts when you're doing these calculations. What is not included are your payroll taxes, taxes that you, the practice owner, pays for your employees. So out of their paycheck comes 7.65% for Social Security and Medicare, and um, you pay the exact same amount for those employees as the employer. So your half of those taxes, your 7.65% of their wages are not a forgivable expense. So your rent and mortgage interest, um, the rent or loan or, uh, agreement need to be in place prior to February 15th of 2020. And we're only talking about mortgage interest, not principal. And when you first read this, you think mortgage, hmm, that's uh, on my house. Well, uh, some folks own their own real estate for their, for their dental offices. And um, you could have a dental freestanding dental building or a condominium or what have you, um, the interest on a loan that you might have on that building is uh, a covered expense and a uh, forgivable expense under the PPP program. That's interest, not principal. The other thing that you think about uh, with mortgage is your house. Forget about it. Sorry, that doesn't count. Uh, but what you don't think about is a mortgage on uh, equipment. So we don't call those mortgages typically, but uh, in the reading, it looks like you can uh, have interest on a, on a practice loan or a practice expansion loan also included in these covered costs. Um, now, if you uh, have a corporation and you rent your building to yourself, um, just make sure that you have an arm's length sort of arrangement that can be documented. And then um, if you have uh, not paid your rent for a couple of months and you're concerned about just retaining cash and uh, cash is king, and let's just say you got your PPP loan on May 15th and you hadn't yet paid your April or May rent, um, we think that counts. We think you can go in and, and cover that. Um, so. As far as utilities are concerned, uh, those services have to be in place um, uh, by, on, had to have been in place on February 15th. Um, and then this is a quick list of what's included in there. There's transportation costs. So we took a webinar um, last week and the presenter, uh, a CPA was telling us that we should go fill up our car and consider that a transportation cost. That seems a little far-fetched to me, but, um, you know, it's listed there, so it is included. And then these things are uh, just questions we have about those expenses and is waste management included. The, the, the reason that um, the costs of rent and utilities are not hugely vital in terms of all of these calculations is that you have to spend 75% of your uh, PPP loan proceeds on payroll costs, which leaves only 25% of your PPP loan for rent, utilities, mortgage interest, and so forth. Um, so it, it shouldn't be too difficult to um, spend your PPP loan on um, rent. It's going to be a little trickier to spend that money on covered payroll costs. So um, to make sure you you know, are careful with, with managing those numbers and lean towards payroll uh, whenever you can so that you don't end up having a problem with forgiveness. Uh, there's three 75% rules in the uh, uh, forgiveness portion of the CARES Act and the PPP loans. Uh, you have to spend 75% of your loan on payroll. Um, and then as it relates to full-time equivalent employees, you have to have at least 75% of those back on payroll by June 30th to be eligible for forgiveness. 
and you have to have 75% uh, of the dollars that you spent on February 15th on payroll uh, being spent on June 30th. So um, that can be tricky stuff. And there are some, some uh, and I didn't see where I put that in my slide, but there's some um, um, exclusions for um, bona fide offers to employees who declined to come back to work because of the coronavirus or also for folks that may have retired. You can't control if someone retired or went out on disability, things like that. So um, there might be some, some forgiveness in the, in the forgiveness formula related to folks that do not or cannot come back to work. And then this last point is pretty important. Um, and I'll mention that uh, the Congress, the House of Representatives has passed this bill called the HEROES Act. And the HEROES Act is, is our, our dream list of things that we would like to be in the PPP loan, like our eight week period starts whenever we want and self-employed people can deduct their or have their uh, health insurance and retirement plans contributions forgiven and so forth. Um, so the CARES Act has yet to um, go to the Senate and the Senate promises that it's dead on arrival. We'll have to see what happens out of that. But the main thing that is in the literature right now, it says that if you're getting uh, PPP loan forgiveness for X dollars of covered expenses, you do not get to double dip and have that loan forgiven and also deduct those expenses. Um, the HEROES Act would like to change that uh, as well as a number of other things, but as it's written right now, um, that that is not going to be allowed. So this is all um, documentation that will be required in filling out your application. And I'm going to uh, take a drink and turn it over to Brett so I can hear my raspy uh, voice and uh, let him pick it up with um, the Q&A, uh, the, the frequently asked questions, and then he's gonna jump into the um, um, application itself. So I'm gonna turn off my screen, Brett, and um, hopefully I can figure out how to do that. Thanks, Aiden. I'll, I'll wait for you so I can pull up my slides. There we go. Let me just... Um get my slides up here. So that, that was great. I, I, I want to just reiterate uh, the, the point that, you know, we, we have put so much time into resources and we're posting it up on our website. If you go to thomasdahl.com, there's a ribbon at the top that says COVID-19 resources. So it, it's uh, www.thomasdahl.com slash COVID-19 and uh, in, the, in that portal, there's the uh, handout for the eligible expenses. That's including the idle and the PPP eligible expenses. That's, that's going to answer a ton of questions on what the money can be used for and can't be used for. And then we have uh, access to a webinar that did a deep dive in, into a case study uh, last week. Uh, th this, this was on May 7th. It's the May 7th resources. And then I've also compiled a huge list of frequently asked questions. So if you have a question on the PPP loan, there's, there's a pretty good chance that it was answered in my frequently asked questions that's posted on, in the May 7th resources on our website for COVID-19. Um, I, I was just looking at the, the Q&A here in, in the webinar and uh, some questions have been rolling in. I'm just gonna take a sec to go through some of the questions real quick. Um, can I reimburse my employee for medical insurance premiums? The answer is it depends if, if, it's, if you're play, paying for group health insurance, that qualifies. If you're just doing a reimbursement for non-group health insurance, uh, pro probably won't be an eligible expense there. Uh, there, there was a question asked, can I hire a floater during the eight week period, meaning somebody that wasn't on payroll before this all started? The answer is yes, that's eligible. 
they'll be on payroll and, and that will go towards your payroll costs. And then probably one of the more important questions, uh, it says PPP was funded May 2nd and my, my eight week period ends on July 2nd, or I'm sorry, June 2nd. How can I process payroll costs as forgivable if I'm only going to be open for a couple of weeks? And, and so, you know, in that situation, you, you probably won't get full loan forgiveness. If you got $100,000, you know, and you're only going to have two weeks of payroll, it, it's likely that you will not get full loan forgiveness. Pay yourself the maximum $15,000. 386. Uh, you know, if, if you have a spouse on payroll, uh, potentially pay your, your spouse, hire your people back um, and pay them what you can when you reopen and uh, you'll, you'll get as much forgiveness as you can. All right, I'm going to jump into the, these, these uh, FAQs. So can I, can I pay deferred rent or prepaid rent? This is one of the biggest changes and updates that we got on Friday. Uh, it used to say that you had to you can only get forgiveness on expenses, both paid and incurred, but they changed the word, they changed it from and to an or. So yes, you, you can now uh, pay for the rent uh, that um, you've deferred. If your landlord was letting you, uh, you know, pay, pay your rent after your PPP, that now qualifies. So if you paid your May rent already before your cover period started, it's being incurred now that you're in your covered period and, and that will qualify. Keep in mind though that, that uh, non-payroll items are capped at 25% anyway of your total loan proceeds. So if you're already over that, you know, if you've already spent $25,000 on rent and utilities out of a $100,000 loan, additional rent payments, trying to sneak in more rents, not, not really going to benefit you. Can I get unemployment if I receive the PPP loan? The answer is, you know, no. If, if, you're, if you're putting yourself back on payroll uh, or your staff, no, they're no longer eligible. How much can you pay yourself as an owner? Uh, that, that, it doesn't matter if you're a sole prop or a corporation, right? You, you can pay yourself um, 15385 That That's eight, eight weeks of the year when you prorate it over a 52 week period. Can I put family on payroll? I mentioned this earlier, yes, you can. Uh, just, just proceed with caution. There's nowhere in the law that says you can't put uh, family on payroll. However, just, just make sure that you're, you're aware if you're hiring family that was never on payroll before, um, before you go out and hire your staff back, you, know, you, you just wanna proceed with caution into that area. And then I, I think one, one more question here, will the start time for the eight week covered period be adjusted or extended? I do not know the answer to that. Um, we, we brought up the HEROES Act, the bill that was voted on by the House that mentioned um, extending the eight week period to a 24 week period. So you would get to, to either extend your eight week period out 24 weeks or go to December 31, whichever is, is uh, whichever hits first. So again, we don't know, uh, the AICPA has been fighting for that. The ADA has been lobbying for uh, an extension. All the restaurants have been lobbying. Uh, but I, I think for now, my advice would be continue on as if it's just an eight week period. And uh, you know, if, if that ends up going through the Senate and gets cleared, then you know, you'll, you'll be lucky and you can go and uh, spend the rest of the money you weren't able to spend if your office was closed for the ma majority of your eight week period. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna jump into um, this new application. The PPP loan forgiveness application is on the SBA website. They just posted it on Friday. So Friday night, they put this up. If you go to the SBA website, uh, or, or just Google search Paycheck Protection Program Loan Forgiveness Application, it's the first thing that will pop up in your browser, okay? So this, this is the actual application that banks will be using. Banks will be able to use, you know, they, they may format it differently. Um, you know, you saw that in the application process, some of the banks 
uh, had had everything available online. And, and so if your bank um, had an online application, they're probably going to make an online version of this that you do through their portal. Uh, but it, essentially, it's going to be the same questions and the same information. Okay, so, so you go through all these. The, the, the first part, it just shows all the, all the things you're going to need to provide with this application. And you get down here on the second page, and there's a, there's a section that says forgiveness amount calculation to complete these costs, complete PPP Schedule A. So when you, when you scroll down to the Schedule A portion, there's a worksheet that we're gonna get into just, just briefly um, and hopefully get you on the right foot so you know where to start and, and kind of have an idea of what you're gonna need here. Uh, the eligible payroll costs, I just wanna highlight this um, one more time. So payroll costs are considered paid on the day that the paychecks are distributed or the borrower originates the ACH transaction. Hayden mentioned that, but now in, in, the, new, um, in the new rules, you get this alternative payroll covered period. You don't have to elect that. You, you can elect that if you want. Uh, for a lot of you dentists, I, I think that, you know, electing the alternative payroll covered period is probably the best option. Uh, get on a biweekly payroll because, for example, if, if you got your loan, let's say May, May 4th, um, and your, your payroll period starts May 1, you can elect to choose the start of the next pay period, right? So instead of having your, your payroll period start May 4th when you got the loan, you can potentially defer, well, not, not potentially, if you're electing this, you can defer the, the start of your eight week period for payroll until May 15th, right? So you can potentially buy yourself an extra 10 days, which is huge if, you've, if your office has been closed. Um, you can gain an extra week or two potentially using the alternative payroll covered period. That's if you're a bi-weekly pay, payroll uh, or semi-monthly and your, your loan um, came in the middle of a pay period. Okay, so let, let's jump down to this. This is, this is the part that you'll start filling out. Really the SBA only wants pages three and four. You're gonna put in all your totals here, sign off all these things on, on the bottom and, and initial all these items, and then turn that into the SBA. But to get the numbers for these, you, you actually need to start with a worksheet. So if you keep scrolling down, this is an 11 page document, and you get down to a, a Schedule A section, this is where you'll, you'll start to fill in the amounts paid during your eight week covered period. So the cash compensation box, you can see right, right away, this comes from PPP Schedule A worksheet. So we already scrolled down to Schedule A. Now we're going to, to scroll down to this next worksheet. So, so really from the start, you, you start off clear down here on page 10 of 11. This is kind of your starting point for calculating the, um, the amount that's, that's forgivable. You do need to list out every single employee some of your banks may have spreadsheets where it's an Excel version. Uh, it, it may just be all available where you may put all this in your um, <clears throat> bank portal, like I met, like I mentioned. But uh, you know the 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 thing to note here is you have two sections. Okay, this section one is for those employees who made less than a hundred thousand in 2019. Okay. Section two down here, table two, this is for those who made more than 100,000 for any pay period in 2019. So if you annualize, if you look at the total amount paid in 2019 and you made more than 100,000, you're gonna be put down here, okay? And, and the reason this is important is because if you pay yourself less than a prorated 100,000 amount, or you have a decrease in wages uh, during the covered period for somebody that used to make over 100,000, it will not account against you in the reduction of payroll, okay? 
So for, for those employees that, that do make less than 100,000, okay, if they make um, more than 25% less than they used to, then, then it, it, it uh, triggers a reduction in your loan forgiveness, okay? Uh, and so that, that's a really important thing to distinguish. Make, make sure you're not cutting uh, people's pay rates during the covered period. Now this is all prorated, so it's based on averages, okay? So if, if, you, um, if you average per pay period or, or per hour and, and they're still the same, it's not gonna count against you. The, um, the full-time equivalents, that kind of is, is uh, hard to follow sometimes, uh, but there is a, a worksheet down here that goes into the full-time equivalents. Okay, you're gonna put, uh, if somebody's a full-time equivalent in this box, they're gonna be entered as a one, okay? So, so if an employee works 40 hours a week, that's a one. If they work less than 40 hours a week, it's a less than one, okay? So if you have somebody that's working 30 hours a week, you would put in 0.75, okay? That, that's, that's how you're gonna calculate this. You're gonna take their average hours over the period and then just divide it by however many hours there would be if they worked a 40 hour work week. So uh, the question that comes up is a lot of you um, are only open for 32 hours right? You might, you might only be open for 32 hours. That's not going to hurt you because the same way that you calculate this number here, you use the same method to calculate it on, on the pay date before the, the covered period started. So if you use a 32 hour work week before you're using a 32 hour work week here. So it's, it's the same. It's, it's not going to hurt you. Okay. Um, down here in this section, it says, enter the borrower's total average full-time equivalents between February 15th and April 26th. And so just to make it easy for you guys, the denominator here is 400 hours. If you count up the weeks, February 15th to 26th, it's 10 weeks. So you have 400 hours that you're dividing it by. So you're going to count up how many hours your employees worked between this period and divide it by 400. And that's going to be your, your number that you put in this box. And then in step two, you're calculating the uh, full-time equivalents that included the pay period of February 15, 2020. So again, you're, you're just going to, there were 80 hours in that pay period if you have a two week pay period. And so you would take the number of hours that all your employees worked and divide it by 80. So, you know, that, that's, that's the, the way that you're, you're going to, um, fill this out. I wanted to spend most time on this because we've been getting the most amount of questions on this form in particular. Now, the, the SBA is allowing uh, a simplified method. And on that method, instead of doing all the division and stuff, they're allowing you to just put 0 0.5, 0 0.5 in this box and using 0 0.5 down here for anyone that works less than 40 hours. So if you had a, an employee that worked 32 hours, you would stick in 0.5 for them if you're using the simplified method. If they worked one hour, you would put in 0.5 for that employee. That's, that's the language, that's how it's written out in this simplified method. And so my, my recommendation is, is look and, and see what method benefits you the most. Okay, if you have, um, if you have a, a lot of, uh, employees that work, you know, 15, 20 hours, maybe temporary hygienists, uh, the, the, the simplified method will probably benefit you more because you get to round up to 0.5. You don't have to do the math. And so that, that's what I wanted to point out on here. I, I'm about out of time. It's an 11 page document and I'm sure we'll have more webinars to come uh, that we post up on our website, thomasdahl.com COVID-19 resources. Um, so watch that and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with that. Thanks so much for, uh, for being here tonight. Uh, thank you, uh, 
Brett and Hayden. Uh, that was fantastic. We're going to go back to Bruce Bohannon and he's going to finish uh, his lecture. Can you see my screen? Can you guys see my screen? Yeah, it looks good. Okay. All right, so here's where I left off. So like I said, the uh, seal, chest, uh, seal check has been waived. So I mean, sorry, your fit test has been waived, but you still have to do the self seal check every time you don the mask. Okay, so how do you tell if these masks are legitimate? So NIOSH is the ones that approve all respirators that we have to use in practice. And so there are several markings that will be on the approved mask. So the brand name should be here. It should have the NIOSH symbol. It should have its classification, an N95 or P100 classifies the mask and its filtration rate. Should have a lot number and a model number. So one of the things that you have to do if you're gonna go out and source these things yourself is all this is included in the uh, PDF uh, for the resources, but you gotta check all of these sites, believe it or not, because they all update at different times, but they are updated fairly regularly. The only thing that can happen here is a distributor may take a mask that looks like it's approved and then becomes not approved later. So that can be an issue. And that has happened to me on one small purchase. So, you gotta check for the authenticity of the mask once it's received. Uh, so sometimes you start with a smaller order because you can't return these things once you get them. So look at this one, they even spelled NIOSH wrong. Okay, and there'll be no markings, uh, the, the serial number will be wrong and it won't match up to the uh, list that's uh, on the particular sites that I referenced. Um, well, you can see this one doesn't have any markings at all. You know that one's not approved. Um, so this was an example actually from Medicos, which who is selling these masks. And then how do you tell if a mask is legitimate? Let's say it meets everything and you want to know if this is a good mask or not. You put the mask on, try to blow out a flame. If the filtration is working, you won't be able to do that. Can you detect the smell of sweet and low? If you can, you know the mask is not protecting you well. The droplet test, place it on the front of the mask. It should beat up like the wax on a car. And then on the inside of the mask, form a cup and actually pour water into it. If it holds the water, it doesn't leak through the front, you know you have a legitimate mask. And this works for N95 or level three. And so the biggest thing, like I mentioned before, is the fit. So you'll see the gaps. What a nice model this is, by the way, but no, I'll mention that later. Um, you, you see that there's a gap that's here. And you'll see the N9, this is a KN95, you see the seal is much better, and this is a, a 3M's uh, N95. You can see how it's actually deforming the skin that's creating that tight seal, which you don't get here. So there are some ways to help that. Uh, one of the ways a lot of people are using is a, a, an app that you can download, you scan your face, you send it, you go to this website because there are several people that will manufacture this for you. They print this thing that actually uh, fits against your face. And then these little clips here go with the mask and then form a much better seal against your face. You can also use these little guys that are available that pull basically the ear loops much tighter. And then there's a way on this website that you can make your own elastomeric band. And the other trick you can do with a uh, level three mask is you tie a knot right at the base where it meets the sides, then flip the mask over and actually fold the pleat inside. So pull, pull it, make it a triangle pointing towards you. And then when you put it on, you can see that the fit is much better. This little gap at the side is eliminated. The other thing you can do is put on skin approved tape across all the borders. So where to buy? This is the problem. If you try to do it yourself, you're gonna to have to do a lot of research. But if you stick with larger distributors, you may have to wait a little bit more time, but these people are vetting everybody because they buy in bulk. And the way this works with all these distributors, it's not net 15 or 30, they have to pay cash up front. So if these become unvalidated, they're stuck with that fee. They can't return them. So if you stick with major carriers, you're probably doing well because they vetted them well. 
And unfortunately, if you have assistance with facial hair, uh, unless they have uh, something that looks, you know, like this, <laughs> um, they aren't going to be able to wear a mask. There's just no way you'll get a fit check uh, pot that's, that will work. You will always have gaps that will leak, so they'll be non-valid. So you're going to have to have that discussion with your employees that have facial hair. Donning and doffing the PPE, this is very important. There's a particular order that you need to, to go over. The biggest thing that I wanna point out is the attire coming into the office. When they get to the office, you should have a designated area where your uh, employees are changing. They change out of their street clothes into their uh, clinical attire. Their shoes should be rubber or washable like Crocs, not tennis shoes. If, if not, you should have boots, you know, regular rain boots if you want. That's helpful. And you really should leave your shoes at the office. Don't take them home because you could be tracking uh, COVID back home and in your car. So it's a good idea to leave sh a pair of shoes at the office. Remove all your personal items. So watches, jewelries, and things like that, you gotta get rid of. And we already talked about the phones. Put it in a sealable bag. You got to pull the hair away from your face, your neck, and your back. Your nails cannot be longer than a quarter of an inch. We already talked about the facial hair. And then once you've gathered your PPE, inspect it. Believe it or not, sometimes they do come from the manufacturer's damaged. If you're going to be in an aerosol producing um, situation, it has to be fluid resistant. It can't be cloth. Um, perform your hand hygiene with soap and water. Okay, or a disinfecting hand sanitizer, put on your shoe coverings, leg coverings, head cover, place your gown. I would then re-sterilize your hands. That's something that's not here. I would do, that's what I do. Then I place my mask on and then the shield goes over my mask. Then I do hand hygiene. Again, put my gloves over that and then enter the room. I know it's a lot of redundancy, but there's a reason for it. And then when you go out, remove the, remove the gloves in the room. Remove the gown. If it's disposable, take it all off at once with the gloves inside that and place it in your uh, garbage, okay? The garbage must be closed, by the way, so it can't be open. Then when you exit the room, you do hand hygiene. And what you're tr trying to do here is protect the mask. You don't want to soil the mask. So um, there's videos here to explain the procedure. And then this is the hand hygiene video that the WHO put out. And here we go again. Oh, we don't want that. Sorry. Okay, but you can see all those videos will be included in the, uh, the, the, link, the link guide. Okay, so a uh, big question is, can we reuse these masks? And um, absolutely, we can reuse these masks. It's- um, uh, Bruce? Oh, yes. I have one question. Uh, we have some conflicting information. Are the initial fit tests and annual fit tests waived for COVID with the masks? So yeah, we went over that, it is waived. However, I recommend it because you've never worked with N95 masks, you wanna ensure that you are providing your employees with a, a, a good protection. And so the only way to make sure that the masks are properly sealed is with a fit test. Okay, Thank However, you. it is not a requirement. Thank you. Okay, uh, reuse masks. This is where you're gonna see a ton of conflicting information. So you'll see things from the CDC that says there are different methods to uh, sterilize a mask so that you can reuse it, but manufacturers will tell you you can't do it that particular way. And so I've made the links and you can check them yourself, but these are the ones that are the CDC says. Rotation method, and I think this is the easiest and most cost-effective way. That's what I do in my practice. Um, and I'll go over that in a minute. UV decontamination does not damage the layers of the mask. A vaporous hydro, hydrogen peroxide, that's basically a, a, a machine that you buy that uses hydrogen peroxide, does not damage the mask. Moist heat, dry heat, microwave, and ethylene oxide are recommended by the CDC, but 3M and Honeywell is in conflict with that. They say it can damage the 
layers of the mask, uh, especially um, that internal layer, that foam layer that we talked about, the melt layer, that's really critical. That's what makes these masks so special. And so when you put it in a microwave, what, after you breathe into the mask, it's humidified. So there are small parts of water in there. When you put it in the microwave, those parts can steam, elevating the temperature above the mass threshold. So the mass threshold is about 180 degrees. It starts to uh, degradate. Um, so you, the best way to avoid contamination to the mask uh, is with covering it and then put it away. Put it in a breathable bag. Mark the bag for the day that it's used and you can use it up to five times. If it does become soiled, you have to throw away the mask. So uh, I don't recommend uh, the dry heat. Dry heat, you can put it in an oven at a particular temperature. Uh, all that is listed in the documentation, but most ovens thermostats uh, aren't accurate. They vary between uh, the temperature that's set. So if you set it at 160 degrees, there are periods of time that may only be 120. There are periods of times it may get as high as 180. And then you're not really getting consistent heat to the mass. So um, people that are buying these little ovens that they're using um, in their offices for sterilization really isn't a good idea. And then we have face shields and goggles. Your eyes have to be protected. So if you look at some studies out of Wuhan and Germany, uh, we saw a huge batch or uh, clusters of infections in uh, ophthalmologists as well as ENT doctors. And of course, ENTs put the little speculum in your nose and they turn the shotgun uh, uh, of where COVID's coming from right at them. And they typically don't have uh, masks on when they're just doing a nasal examination. And then the ophthalmologists use that little slit lamp when you go there and they're right up against your face. Uh, and if you've ever had the little eye test that your doctor does, your uh, internist, they get really close to look at the back of your retina. And of course, they're not protected. And so you saw clusters of infection in primary care people, ENT and ophthalmologists. So goggles seal against the face and they protect the eyes how the virus gets in, it goes through your nasal lacrimal duct and then it gets into your uh, sinuses and that mucosa is how it gets into, into your system. And so you can use a face shield uh, or you can use what's called a PAPR, which is a powered air purifying respirator. So if you look here, this actually creates a seal against the chin. This mask then pumps in filtered clean air, keeps the mask cool and fogging. This one has that part of the device here except it's, it's a little bit, it has a little bit of an opening that's here, but this is the design is to try to keep you getting fresh recycled air um, so you don't have to worry uh, about contamination. So lights over your face shield, because a lot of the face shields uh, aren't going to be able to keep your loops and lights in. Now some do, so it's a trial and error, but some lights uh, manufacturers allow you to convert your light to a, a elastic headband. And so in the picture here, that's what I did. I converted mine from a fixed one to an elastic one and it actually will fit around the face shield. And I can't stress this enough, hygiene is important in the hospital. Anytime you have patient contact area, what's called foam in and foam out, meaning you clean your hands before you enter the room, you clean them on the exit. That's a, just a great habit to get into, and that's one of your best weapons against the virus. And then your protective gear. So we all know about standard precautions, which was a uh, change from the universal precautions that we had a long time ago. But now there's other respiratory things that we have to worry about. There are respiratory uh, precautions uh, uh, that we that are now in play. Uh, certainly, we talked about the respirator, face shield, waterproof apron. Usually now they're recommending two pairs of gloves and we have to have fluid resistant coverings and shoe coverings, which we didn't have to have before. And I think that's also important, like I mentioned previously, that you leave your shoes at the office, you don't bring them home. And the first thing you should do when you get home don't hug your kids, pet your dog, do anything like that. Go straight to the shower and shower. Okay, 
laundry service and PPA suppliers. I don't think it, your employees should be taking their clinical attire home. If you can launder on site, that's great. You have to launder at 160 degrees Fahrenheit for 25 minutes. You should add bleach um, or get a service. You literally put them in a, 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 a fluid uh, resistant bag. They come, they take it away, they clean it and they bring it back. They also are a great supplier of some of the PPE that you're gonna have a hard time finding because they purchased it in bulk and they can rent that to you. Uh, so that may be a way that you can circumvent trying to supply all these things yourself. Now I listed a few that are here, Unifirst, Healthcare, Allsco um, are all local and uh, they are accepting new customers. Now this is important, is communication while masked. We need to shorten our appointments because we've got to see more patients because they're going to be spread out more. We can't, we can't um, produce what we used to. So we're going to probably have to work more days, more hours, but we're not going to be able to have the time to sit there and really get to know your patients really well for two reasons. One, we have some studies that I've listed in, listed in the links that show that just normal talking like I am doing right now, if I'm shedding virus starts to spread into the air and in a closed tight room, within 10 minutes, you, you're producing about a thousand respiratory droplets per minute. Now, when you sneeze, that goes up to 30,000. When you cough, it's somewhere, depending on the force of the cough, somewhere between three and 15,000. So we wanna limit the time that they're in there. And I tell you, if you're talking to the patient, they should present to the clinic with a mask and they should leave the mask on while you're talking to them until it's time to do your exam or whatever you need to do. But they can't see you smile, which is one of the biggest things to reassure your patient or reduce their anxiety. So they're gonna look at your other actions and your interpersonal uh, movements and your nonverbal clues. And so your body language is absolutely critical. Uh, relax your shoulders, don't cross your arms. Look engaged, definitely look them in the eyes. Use your eyes and eyebrows. Good eye contact is so important here. Um, uh, your tone of voice is gonna be absolutely key. Uh, and then create a safe space, meaning maintain your social distancing, have a clear path of flow for your patients and make sure you have a clear path of flow for your workers. Make sure to remove any physical barriers that could block your view. Uh, and you also, because I, I think you should have pictures of all your staff in the front because they're gonna see people when they walk in in masks. At least if they introduce themselves and they've had a reference to, the, to that in your waiting area, they'll know who you're talking about. However, this is another pet peeve, I think we need to end the days of a waiting room. They're not gonna be check-in stations or whatever term you want, but we're not gonna have a full waiting room. In my practice, they knock on the door, they're intercepted before they enter, um, although we've called them the day before to confirm and gone over screening questions, we screen them again when they hit the door. We take pulse oximetry and we do um, uh, temperature. So we screen them before we hit the door so that if they uh, are positive, they don't enter and contaminate your facility. And then while they're being treated, we try not to have any of their family members in the, in the waiting area. Pediatrics may be difficult, but if, if you have to have somebody waiting there, it should only be a single parent, or if it's an elderly person and they have a caregiver, if they need to be present, it should only be that person. If not, everybody should be in the hallway or out in their car. You, you can text them when you're done. You should also try to be doing as much contactless payment as possible. If you have to handle a credit card, grab it with a tissue, swipe it, and then give it back to them. So your appointment times are gonna be shorter because you gotta minimize conversational viral shedding like we mentioned. Maybe we need these things so they can see our face. I think this gets a little ridiculous, but this is out there, believe it or not. So you need time to see more patients in addition, uh, in a distance and staggered schedule. Um, I have found that most patients appreciate that they're taking the time to safely and seriously take their um, healthcare and their risk to heart and that you're doing what you can to protect them. They also know the situation has been quite hard on all of us. So that's what I've seen in my practice from the patients. So I had some questions that have come up 
uh, quite a bit. And so do I need to change my lab coat and mask between a basic non-aerosol exam? And the answer is no. So in that case, actually a level one mask is fine. I think you should all have level three if possible. Your staff that has no patient contact, your front office patient, I think a level one mask is fine. Make sure you do uh, hand hygiene. And do I need to change the footies between each patient? And should we use these or boots? That's a choice you have to make, but the answer is no. You should dispose of your shoe coverings at the end of the day. And again, I think you should leave your shoes at work. If they are rubber, you can sterilize your shoe with Lysol spray, and leave them there overnight, they'll be fine in the morning. And then knowing what I know, a lot of people are, especially employees, uh, are fearful of returning to work. I have a little special uh, knowledge of what's going on here is my medical training, we have a docent system. A docent system is where you have one mentor that really takes you through your entire medical training career uh, while you're in medical school. Mine happened to be a guy named Warren Stahl, and he was an infectious disease doctor with a specialty for virology. He also did a lot of public health and performed a lot of the epidemiologic studies for the county. So my rotations, my elective ones, I did a lot with him through uh, the TB wards, as well as uh, uh, symphilitis patients or meningitis patients in isolation and negative pressure rooms. So I understand this disease a little bit better. Uh, doesn't make me an expert, but I can tell you what I know. If you do these protocols that are, that are out there, your home is the safest place. There's no question about that. But your office is gonna be the next safest place. The, the next one on the list is Costco and your supermarket. If you look at the people that come into Costco or your supermarket, they don't distance that well. Some do, some don't. Half of them have their masks pulled down, either their nose are exposed or their mouths exposed. They have it under their chin. There's big gaps. I see people touching their face all the time and they look, hey, hon, what do you think of this product? This looks good, right? Now they've touched and contaminated that. The carts are all contaminated, so I'd suggest you spray those down with alcohol or do whatever, but your risk of going to a Costco or a supermarket is much higher than your office. Certainly an emergency waiting room is gonna be risky because that's where patients go when they're sick and likely some of them will have the virus. And of course, a nursing home uh, can be the worst spot because these patients are very vulnerable and some of the care that's delivered there don't follow a lot of the protocols. So through, if we look at one of the studies that I've included in the link, it talks about a dental clinic in Wuhan. They listed a percentage of dental uh, students and staff and auxiliary staff of an infection rate, and this before they knew they were in a pandemic, of 0.47%. After they did contact tracing, they found that the majority of that 0.47% were actually infected outside in the community and not probably from the clinic. We also look at CDC numbers. CDC has had no outbreak or clusters within the dental field. So it is pretty safe because we've always been using precautions that should have protected us. This disease has been around before uh, we started to hear about it. We didn't have testing for it. We didn't know it was over here. I mean, I guess there's some, some debate about that, but it had been here. We know it had been here either in the late fall or early winter. So it's very likely that some of you have seen these patients. And a lot of us did not get sick because we do follow these protocols. Um, through, if you go back to that uh, study that was both from Wuhan and the EU, they show that the medical, um, the doctors, the nurse, the support staff, now they had a fairly decent infection rate of somewhere, depending on which study you were, from the low teens, the high teens, because when they greet patients, they don't have masks on, they don't have gloves on, um, they can get very close to a patient. They didn't know these were going on, so they don't use respiratory controls when they're doing regular exams. It wasn't until they were alerted to this did they know that this was an issue. And through, through crisis comes clarity, and we, we change what we do through revolution, not evolution in these particular sense. So we, 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 we beginning to understand the data, we've developed plans, that can beat the virus, now you have to simply implement them, okay? 
So we're gonna, I'm gonna do some follow-up recordings on administrative controls, how to screen patients, what you should ask for. This is changing a ton. Uh, we also uh, are trying to keep up with all the regulations that are happening. The state puts a regulation out through the Department of Health, but your county may put out something more restrictive. We found out today that San Francisco is requiring that you, uh, you have your patients tested. And I'll also talk about what I think about testing. And then after they're tested, they have to isolate themselves until the test results come out and then you see them in your office. I think that's insane, but that, that's what San Francisco has done. I'm hoping that our county health um, officials are not quite as draconian. I, I don't think that's proper. But then there's also some environmental controls that you can do. And understanding the virus will allow you to mitigate the risk by understanding the science. And then you can develop your best practices and perceptions. Uh, and remember, whatever you create, it has to be fluid because things are going to change as we understand more about the disease. And of course, obviously, there's probably going to be more regulations. So contact your patients, let them know what you're doing to protect them. Get that back to work ADA toolkit. I can't stress how important that is so you can start to develop protocols and practices that fit for your practice because everybody's practice is a little bit different. And then make sure everything works in your office. You've been out of it for a while, things do break. The gremlins come in and they break things. So make sure everything works. Make sure your staff is understanding what you do. Practice what you're going to implement two or three times because your patients are gonna recognize if you're fiddling around and you don't know what you're doing, that's gonna scare them off. And start slowly with a few patients and then ramp up keeping proper distancing and spacing as you get the new system down. This all seems overwhelming at first, but if you break it down into small steps, it's very doable. That's all I have for you tonight. Uh, thank you very much, Bruce. Uh, we have a few questions for you. Uh, there's a lot of questions about air purifiers. So if you can kind of talk about that and clarify, that would be excellent. And also what temperature uh, should we be turning away patients or, and or staff? Well, so one of the, uh, I'm going to take the temperature one first. So one of the things I think why we should be seeing emergencies is because if you look at asymptomatic patients, what we call uh, pre-symptomatic patients, meaning patients that are infected and probably shedding the virus that are not showing symptoms yet versus uh, patients that have the virus that are completely asymptomatic, um, we're understanding more and more that if you ask more and more questions, because this disease is starting to affect more and more uh, systems, you'll actually get more positive answers. People, when they're asked closed questions, will only respond to that question. So if you say, hey, have you had a fever, cough, or malaise? And they say no, they might have had other symptoms that we know now, headache, loss of taste and smell, uh, diarrhea can be one of the first things now that pops up, or a strange rash of the, of the extremities, the fingers and toes. If you don't ask that, they're not going to present it. We also know that checking a pulse oximetry can be good because these patients compensate very well, but they may have a resting a pulse, pulse ox of less than 94%. Um, the other thing that may be interesting um, is if you're not mitigating or seeing these patients uh, and treating them, they come into your office in pain, what have they been doing? They've been taking acetaminophen, they've been taking Motrin, which is gonna blunt a febrile response. However, if they haven't, the cutoff is 100.4. If they're 100.4 or more, you should assume that that patient is infected, you should not let them enter your practice, and you should refer them to their physician. Their physician will then determine what course of action, how long they should be isolated, and usually the physician will issue you some clearance of return. The other question regarding um, environmental changes. Those things are big. I'm, I have a lecture that I'm going to do that has a lot of detail with that, and so that question can get fairly long-winded. Um, but read me back the question one more time. Um, the question was in regards to uh, air purifiers and, uh, you know, just some of the things. The, the, the first thing you should do is check. I mean, if you've built your own place, you should check with your HVAC person. 
Um, you want good airflow through your office. You don't want a stagnant office. That's where the the the, uh, the aerosol is going to sit and stay for we know at least three hours. We know if you go back for the pandemic, the Spanish flu back uh, in the early 1900s, that patients that were kept in what's called an open ward hospital, where the windows were open, had far less transmission rates than those patients that were in a closed environment. So just simply getting airflow through your office is a big help, but sometimes in a closed office, that's not possible. So check with your HVAC installer, uh, whoever built it, or unfortunately you're gonna have to call your landlord. Prior to 2001, you should be recycling at least six times or greater than six times, you should recycle that air in an hour. After 2001, it's actually greater than 12. You should also check your filters. You need to have at least a MERV 13 filter or better yet a HEPA filter um, to filter out the majority of the respiratory droplets that are present. Um, if you wanna have standalone ones, I think that's great. Positioning is gonna be important. You want it away from the head. You want it down by the foot. You wanna pull things away. You don't wanna come in back at you. Uh, however, uh, I will have some pictures uh, that I think are high-speed uh, pictures of uh, aerosol. Believe it or not, your high-speed suction, as long as it's close to your, your point of, of, of action wherever you're operating, does an incredible job at reducing aerosol. So investing in all of these different things is not a requirement currently, it's simply a suggestion. Right now, the only requirements are screening, distancing, and PPE. All right. But, but I did talk about earlier, perception is important. So if you want to go above and beyond that, that's fine. And I talk about those things in the environmental portion, in the engineering portion that will come out later this week. And one last question. Uh, should uh, we use a level three mask over a KN95? So we talked earlier in the, um, the presentation that the, K, the, the N95s do a great job at filtering a little bit better than the level three but it's poor and fluid. Level three is pretty good filtering, but they're very fluid resistant. We, if you're planning on reusing your N95, because right now you can, when it's lifted, when this emergency use authorization is lifted, after you have an N95 for one patient, you're gonna have to throw it away, but that's not coming back until supply is returned. But it does make sense to cover your N95 with at least a level one, better if it's a level three, so you're protecting the um, N95 from soilage, because if it gets soiled, you gotta toss it. Yeah, we understand that, uh, but with a KN95, should we put a level so KN, one? So KN95 is equivalent to an N95. Yes, you should be covered. All right, excellent. All right, Bruce, thank you so much. You're uh, yeah, and thank you Hayden and uh, Brett for your excellent presentation. We did capture all of the questions in the question and answer box, but unfortunately we ran out of time. So we will be emailing the answers to all of your questions and you should be receiving those soon. I wanna thank you all for joining us tonight. We realize that the information discussed continues to be fluid and it changes daily, but we hope you found this helpful. This meeting was recorded, recorded and it will be posted on our SMCDS Facebook page. So thank you again to our presenters who volunteered their time and to our wonderful SMCDS staff, Nakia, Mike, Jim, and Shirley. Everybody stay safe and enjoy the rest of your evening.